Welcome to our reflections on the book of Genesis. This is the first book of the Bible and the book that is absolutely essential if we're going to in any way understand uh, all the drama that follows through the rest of the Bible. Amazingly, the first book of the Bible and the last book of the Bible are actually quite well connected. There is a massive amount of information that needs to be given between Genesis 1 to 11. I won't be able to give that amount of information, but I'm going to try and give you a coherent reflection that will hopefully uh, fill in some of the dots for you and let you begin to understand something of the drama which begins here and actually unfolds throughout the rest of the whole Bible. I want to alert you to the fact that things are not what they seem because when the uh, writers of the book of Genesis and indeed any other book of the Bible uh, were putting the text together, they were uh, wanting it to be understood at different levels. So there is the uh, basic level of what your eyes actually see when you read the text. Then there is very often a prophetic level which is understood in this text. And above that, there is also a spiritual level. And there is a further one that is actually very important, which I need to introduce you to from the very beginning. And the scholars call it types. There are types and symbols uh, used in the uh, what we call the Old Testament. And a type means that a, a person or an event has value in itself, but it also points to something else. And when it points to something else, you will be amazed that when you make the comparison, how much you learn about the uh, initial thing. So there's the type and the anti-type, the, the two sides of this revelation. And you're only given in the first reading, you're only given uh, what is there in front of your eyes, and it's up to people like me to point out where this is actually leading. I will do some of that for you. It's not actually possible to do it all because the text is far too rich. First of all, the word Genesis comes from Bereshit. And Bereshit means beginnings. And you find the beginning of everything in this book. Uh, for example, uh, you have the beginning of creation, that's obvious. You have the beginning of the revelation of who God is. He reveals himself as the creator and Lord of the universe. We have a strange thing called the separation of light and darkness. And then parallel good and evil. We have the beginning of the human race. And it comes from the hand of God. We have the beginning of marriage as God's own plan for the future of humanity. We have the beginning of what uh, later books will call walking with God. That means the beginning of the human race having intimacy with God. The human race actually living an interior spiritual life, not just an exterior physical life. So immediately I've introduced you to a lot of things uh, without even uh, reading a word of the text. But that's not at all. There's an immense amount. I'm only going to hint at some of it. We have the beginnings of sin and temptation and the, what follows from it. We have the beginning of the revelation of God's mercy and God's justice as well. We have the very first prophecy of the entire Bible given in Genesis 3.15, the promise of a savior. We have the beginning of the nations of the earth and how they spread. We have the beginning of the first judgment of the earth, which was a chastisement by water. We have a second judgment of the earth given to us. This is all in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. We have the second judgment given to us at the Tower of Babel. We call it Babel, it is in fact Babel trying to the false god of Bel and the, the scattering of the people uh, around the earth. We have the first judgment by fire given to us 
with Sodom and Gomorrah. So water and fire, absolutely amazing. We have the beginnings of what we call election by grace. That is a human being actually called by God to walk with him and to cooperate with God in trying to found the kingdom of God on earth. That's the story of Abraham, and that begins in chapter 12. You have the beginning of covenants with God. We have a covenant with Adam, which is presumed, a covenant with Noah, and a covenant with Abraham, just to give you an example. And we have the first true, real surrender to God in the story of Abraham and Isaac. And that is just a tiny, tiny smattering of all the firsts that you find in the book of Genesis. The first words of the Bible are these, Bereshit bara et ha shamayim ve'et ha eretz. They're the original words in Hebrew. We read in English that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is so much in this statement that you could spend the rest of the time just talking about that alone. Okay. But I just want to pick up a few things and point them out to you because that's going to help us in interpreting the rest of the text as we go along. For example, the verb bara means that the author of this text deliberately chose a verb to try and put across in very precise language that God brought something into existence that had not had existence before. This was an absolute original. There was nothing, and then there was something. And only God could actually do that. So in this action of bringing something from non-existence into existence, we have the sovereign power of God illustrated for the first time that he originates all things, and we will see as soon as they come into being that he regulates them as well. He not only creates, he also preserves, and he rules, he regulates, and that is all things. The next thing we discover, and I haven't read a line for you yet, the next thing we discover is that everything came into being by his divine will alone. No other reason. Now, if we look at these things, we are going to have to ask huge theological questions of ourselves. Huge. And I haven't given you anything except the first line. Okay. So we are told God exists. We're not given any reason for that statement. And so the very first statement in the Bible actually repudiates the whole of atheism, which says that God doesn't exist. God's existence is actually presumed as a fact that the human race understands and lives with, not something that has to be argued, not something that has to be proved. It's simply affirmed as a fact. Okay, and the existence of the whole universe around us is also a fact you can see it for yourselves. And we're not told how long it took for this to come into existence, but simply where it originated. It originated in God, okay? And therefore, if everything came out of nothing into being, then God has also, through this text, uh, repudiated materialism living for material things alone, as if material things could produce anything. And so God is distinguished absolutely from his creation. There is God. There is nothing. God brings everything into being. Now, this is affirmed by the later prophets. For example, Isaiah 45 verse 18 says, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God? who formed the earth and made it, who has established it and did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited and who said, I am the Lord, there is no other. So there you have the, the fact of God's existence 
put to us very, very clearly. And so it is stated very simply in Genesis, the prophets in later centuries pick it up and give it back to us with explanation. And you could go on into the New Testament as well. The other thing that this one sentence repudiates is pantheism. This statement about God actually repudiates pantheism because pantheism means a whole choir of false gods, which we will have to deal with as we go along. And it asserts that there is one personal God who is responsible for everything. And since he made the heavens and the earth, therefore he is infinite and he's omnipotent. So already in the first sentence of the Bible, we've actually learned a lot and we're going to learn more as well. So since God is the initiator of everything and he's the origin of all things, you'll find in the Bible that he is called Abba. And that is translated into English as Father, but it actually means my origin. Okay. Uh, so Avi is my father or my origin. So unbelievers try to explain reality by starting with the human race and working its way up. That doesn't actually solve anything. What you find in the Bible is that we start with God and God as the initiator of everything. And we work down from there and it actually answers all our questions. It's actually very important. Okay. And what we're going to see is that what God creates actually reveals what he is like. So we're going to see an extraordinary perfection, beauty, harmony, order. Uh, it's, it's incredible. And all of this are uh, just simply glimpses of what he is actually like. We are going to, to look at this in a bit of detail because um, it's necessary in this first chapter of Genesis. So let me now read it for you in English. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then I want to present the very first problem of the Bible for you, which is in verse two. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay, so there's nothing there except God. So where does this darkness come from? It's a problem. Where does this void come from? Where does this chaos come from? And unless we solve this, uh, the chapter one of Genesis will remain a mystery to you all the time. And you will not understand that it is a template for understanding the rest of the Bible. It actually is the key that opens the door. Now, God is life, light, order, harmony, beauty, perfection in all its forms. So where does this stuff come from? Uh, if you go to the first letter of St. John, chapter one and verse five, you read, God is light. In him, there is no darkness. And if you read 1 Timothy 6, 16, you will read that God lives in unapproachable light. So where is this stuff coming from? So once the question is asked, then we must actually uh, pursue it. So something is presumed here in verse two that isn't explained for a long, long, long time. But obviously the audience uh, receiving this text uh, from the authors actually knew what they were talking about. And that is that we have to be dealing with a time after the fall of the angelic choirs not mentioned here, okay? And when the angelic uh, beings moved away from God, they were moving away from light. That creates darkness. When they move away from love, they move towards hatred. When they move away from harmony, you move away to disorder and chaos and all the rest of it. Ah, light and darkness, okay? And so we're going to find we're automatically introduced to light and darkness, good and evil, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan. It's all going to be put in front of us in one simple dose. But because they want to get on with describing 
what happens next. They don't give you any detail. The detail comes uh, in later books of the Bible. For example, you have to go to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation in chapter 12, to find that there was a court case in heaven and that Satan and his fallen angels were thrown out. But where did they go? They came to the earth. Now, since their darkness and chaos and disorder and all the rest of it, what are they going to bring to the earth? Exactly that. So uh, you will find, therefore, we're introduced to light, representing God, the kingdom of God, God's order, beauty, harmony, and so on, and the kingdom of darkness, which is the kingdom of Satan, and its disorder and its chaos and ugliness and unhappiness, what we call hell. Now, we need this to understand between chapters three and chapter six, because I will summarize these chapters for you by saying that sin increased and multiplied and filled the earth and conquered it and turned it into a hell and God had to deal with it. Because he can't have hell on earth. That was not his plan. So if, if I say this is an introduction to you, then you will realize you're going to read the days of creation in a different way than you would have read them before. Because I want you to try and hear what the authors are actually saying to us. If you go to the Gospel of John, chapter 3 and verse 19, you'll hear Jesus saying through John, on these grounds is sentence pronounced that though the light came into the world, men have chosen darkness over the light because their deeds were evil. So we're going to be introduced to light and darkness here in creation. But you have to understand, it's not just physical light and darkness, it's also spiritual light and darkness. And we'll deal with that. Now, something I can't go into at all because the, there is definitely no time. There's 50 chapters in Genesis. <laughs> okay, it's no chance I can go into it. But maybe you can go into it. And that is, if you go to Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15, you'll find him alluding to the fall of Lucifer uh, in his uh, text in which he deals with the death of a tyrant. You'll find Ezekiel doing exactly the same thing in chapter 28 of his book from verses 11 to 28. They all knew about this stuff. And so it, it was certainly not new to them. It may be unfamiliar to us because we've become so worldly and so material and so on. So that's actually very important. So. If the darkness and the chaos that we're looking at in verse 2 is what I'm suggesting it might be, then you have from verse 3, day 1 to day 6, you're having the first restoration of the earth. Now, if I give it to you like that, it's going to be actually quite important, okay? God has to reform to make the earth exactly what he wants. And when you see what he begins to do, it is really fascinating. Okay. Now, nobody knows the amount of time that passed between Genesis 1, verse 1, and Genesis 1, verse 2. It could be eons of time. We just don't know. So we're not looking at, at that and simply looking at the facts that we're actually dealing with. And so the, the first six days of creation then is bringing order out of chaos. Now that's a very important theme in the entire Bible. For example, that's what redemption is, bringing order out of chaos. A sinner comes to the Lord, there's chaos inside of them, there's darkness, there's uh, disorder, there's disharmony, there's unhappiness and so on. And the Lord has to gradually bring that person into order and happiness and grace and light and fruitfulness and the fullness of life. So what we're going to look at on the material creation, we will also be looking at spiritually as well, because what happens spiritually is even more important than what happens physically. Uh, and what happens physically is to enable the restoration of the human race to happen spiritually. Now, the restoration of the human race, you go down to the Gospels. 
Here we're, we're looking at the very beginning, but I want you to see that the entire Bible is one interwoven fabric, that it, it all knits together very nicely. The old, what we call the old and the new, why we use that language, I can't imagine, because the New Testament is 2,000 years old, but that's the language people use. But the whole thing is interwoven and uh, there is no disconnection between them. There is no way we can say that the Old Testament is not needed for Catholics. No way at all. You absolutely need it to understand what is going on in the so-called New Testament. Uh, so this is very important. So I want to give you another hint at a wonderful area that I can't go into, but maybe you can go into it. And that is, we're told God created. Then we're told the Spirit of God hovered. And then we're told God spoke and creation came into being. The very first hint of the plurality of persons in the Blessed Trinity. The word that the Hebrew uses for God is Elohim, which is plural. And then you see the plurality of persons in the Godhead and they are completely united in having one will. There is one divine will. This begins to unfold as you go through not only the book of Genesis, but the rest of the books of the Bible as well. Now, God spoke everything into being. If you find that difficult to accept, just go to the Gospels and Jesus said, be healed, and they were healed. He told Lazarus, four days in, in a grave, come forth, and he came forth. God speaks things into being. And when you realize, looking at Jesus, that he spoke healing into people's lives, he spoke life into them, he raised them from the dead, then you know who he is, because that is God's work. As we begin to read the creation account in Genesis chapter 1, I want you to notice that the expression, let there be, or let something come into being, is given to us in verses 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 15, 20, 24, 26, and 30. That's the Ten Commandments of creation. A commandment is an order that something should happen. And there's 10 exactly. That's important. 10 in the Bible represents fullness, completion. So when this is done, we will be reading the words that everything is completed. It's finished. Okay. As we go through it, I want you to notice that the word good, everything is good, is given seven times that the word heaven is also given to us seven times. And seven is the number of perfection. So what we are shown at the end of this text is that the stamp of perfection reveals the author, tells you who he is. He's good, he's life, he's light, he is creator, he's omnipotent, he's infinite. He's the, not only the creator of the universe, but the one who preserves it in being as well. It tells us a lot about God. The next thing is, and I want to give it to you so that it is an introduction to chapter two as well. And that is that the way the text is given to us, God is going to create a son for himself on the earth. That son is going to be called Adam, simply because Adam means dust. He's going to create one. and. What he's going to do is, first of all, make a home for this son on the earth. And so he chooses a plot of land, which is uh, planet Earth. He puts a house on it. There's a roof, which is the, the sky, and the, it's peopled with uh, lights and stars and everything. And then he gives them the facilities to live, which are air, water, and food. And he gives them, he gives this 
son of his that he wants to enjoy life on earth, he gives him the most magnificent paradise to live in. Now that's described very well in chapter two. It's just simply stated in chapter one. And so he gives him a place to live in, a place of beauty and order and fertility and light, which is like himself. So the son, Adam, and all his descendants were meant to live happiness on the earth, a happiness in communion with God on the earth. So that is uh, what is happening. We're not told how long it took. There's no statement about that at all. We're simply told that it took six days. Now that seems to be a contradiction that I said we're not told how long it took and then I'm saying it took six days. But you have to understand that Psalm 90 verse 5 says that with the Lord a thousand years is like a single day. And that is quoted by St. Peter in 2 Peter 3, 8. So that's why I say while we're told six days, we're not actually told how long. And I'm going to show you the importance of the six days at a later point. On day one, we have the darkness dispelled and light inserted. Now, light represents God. So the, the chaos that was there is pushed back and the entrance of God into creation. And so the day represents uh, God's presence and the kingdom of light and so on. And the darkness represents the kingdom of darkness and so on. So we have, even in the day and night uh, movement that we experience every day, the reminder of the two great kingdoms of light and darkness. And then we're given an absolutely extraordinary expression that people just read and pay no attention to. Evening came and morning came the first day. Evening came, morning came the second day and so on. You mean the day begins in the evening? and that it ends in the morning? That means a 12-hour day. That's not the way we measure days nowadays. Our days are twice that long. But if you take that measurement of a 12-hour day and go down to the resurrection of Jesus in which you're told that he was three days in the tomb, it makes sense if there are three 12-hour days from sundown on Friday to sun up on Saturday sun up on Saturday to sun down on Saturday and sun down on Saturday to sun up on Sunday, the 12 hour days. Now, we would think it was more logical to say that a day begins in the morning with sunrise. That's the way we look at it. But because the book of Genesis tells us that evening came and morning came the first day, that all the great feasts of the church begin with a vigil on the evening before, and that it finishes with the celebration of the liturgy on the following day. Evening came and morning came the first day. This is just an important little note I want to give you. So when we uh, look into this, uh, we're going to discover that in chapter three, the amazing event of the fall of the human race happens so quickly after the beginning, so quickly. And what we find is that as soon as Adam and Eve fall, darkness enters into their intellect, memory and will, the three great powers of the soul. Chaos enters into their lives. Disorder enters into them. And sickness, sin, death follows. And so, we needed to be introduced to the deeper meaning of darkness as distinct from physical darkness, so that when we come to chapter three, we will actually understand what's going on. When you go to the New Testament, for example, and you have the recreation of the human race in redemption, you have St. John giving us a seven day account in chapter one that actually encompasses the whole gospel. And you find the light has come into the world 
John's Gospel tells you that the whole way through, okay? And that the light repudiates, pushes back the darkness. And when we enter into our relationship with our Redeemer, that we must repudiate the darkness that is inside of us and we must call the light into us. Uh, Psalm 36 verse 9 says, Lord, in your light we see light. You have got to give us your light in order for us to be able to see light. Uh, Psalm 119 verse 130 says, as your word unfolds, and I'm going to try and do that with you at the book of Genesis, unfold the word uh, step by step with you, it gives light. In other words, it enlightens our intellect. It gives us understanding. And so the simple understand. And so the recovery of the human race is to receive this enlightenment from God. And we receive this through repentance, prayer, scripture, Eucharist, sacraments, and so on. And But we have to enter into spiritual warfare because there is uh, disorder and sin and darkness and the results of all of that inside of us. So we have to get into spiritual warfare through self-denial and mortification. That is pushing the darkness away so that the light can enter. If the self is continues to rule in us, then divine love can't be born. The self has to die or give way to the uh, love that needs to come and to rule in our lives. And in order for this to happen, literally from the very beginning, from our baptism, the Spirit of God hovers. Now, there's an enormous amount that can be said about this. Absolutely gigantic. I can only uh, stimulate you to go and look for it yourself. At the very beginning, in verse 2, we're told that the Spirit of God hovered so that the Word of God could come forth, okay, and create. If you go down to the New Testament and find uh, a young virgin, Mary, in Nazareth, you find the Spirit of God hovering over her, and the Word of God leaves his heaven, and a man is created inside of her so that the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. When Jesus becomes an adult before his ministry, you find that he's standing in the waters of the Jordan and the Spirit of God hovers over him and then through him, all of the recreation of the human race can actually take place. In our baptism, the Spirit of God hovers over us as well so that the recreation of each one of us can happen so that the recreation happens internally as well as externally. If we only read these texts as something that happened back there in the distant history and it's not happening to us now, then I think we miss an awful lot of it. Okay. The very first thing we read in verse 3 is Vayomer uh, Elohim vehi or et vehi or. That's the Hebrew. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now notice, if he says it, it becomes a reality. God's word is creative. Now, the Gospels illustrate that all the time with Jesus. His word is creative. When God's word comes into us from our meditation on his word, uh, when it comes into us or whether he speaks it directly to us, it is creative. It brings about what it says. Okay, um, and verse four says, and God saw the light and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. That dividing of the light from the darkness is the whole struggle of the entire Bible. Dividing all that represents darkness and from all that represents light. And that is the source of the struggle that's inside of us as well that light and darkness will not mix. So when the Lord comes to us with grace, sin has to go. It's about as simple as that. We can't have two kingdoms within us. That would be spiritual schizophrenia. It doesn't work, it destroys you. In verse six, it says, 
that God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now we're coming to a new stage. We have divided light and darkness, and now we're going to be dividing waters. What is going on? When it says that God made the firmament, we call that space, where the billions of galaxies are and the even greater billions of stars in each one of the galaxies. So while we call it space, uh, the scientists uh, are discovering there isn't much space out there. God filled the universe. And you're going to find when he puts creatures on the earth that the earth teems with creatures. God wants his house full. He wants plenty of children of all kinds, whether they are stars or animals or plants or humans or whatever. He wants plenty of children. He wants his place full. He loves life. And that's why we're going to find later on when he gives commandments, he doesn't do it in, in uh, Genesis. Uh, in the book of Exodus, when he gives commandments, we're not allowed to take life. He pours love into us. We're not allowed to destroy love. You can enjoy love. You can uh, live with it. You can have its fruitfulness and everything else, but you're not allowed to destroy it. And that is because life and love are uh, major aspects of the being of God himself. Okay. So, when the children on the earth look up into this magnificent sky above us, the firmament above us, we are looking at the magnificence and immensity and omnipotence and glory of God. And we're meant to look up to first of all, begin to contemplate the greatness and goodness of God. So if we look up, there's no way we can remain atheist. We look elsewhere and find you can not remain atheists if you really look as well. So he populates uh, the space uh, with all of these uh, galaxies and stars and so on. And then on day three, he starts doing something very interesting. And that is he's dividing waters. Okay, waters above and waters below. And then we're told that the earth seems to appear out of the waters. Now that's actually physically true, that you know our mountains have been uh, pushed up uh, from the depths. But you're looking at the resurrection of the earth from the deep. In this whole thing, there's a, a, a death and resurrection theme uh, just hovering around it. Um, and as the earth emerges, uh, and becomes dry, then the Lord populates it with life. Okay, now we're going to find this again in the story of Noah, that the earth will have to emerge from the waters a second time. So if I point that it happens again down in Noah, they'll realize I'm not making it up here because the themes begin here and are developed later on, okay. So it's when the earth is raised from the waters that it is then clothed with life. Go down to John chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus. As soon as he is raised, Jesus says that he's to be clothed and fed again. When, the, when he raises the little uh, 12 year old girl uh, from the death, he also tells his parents uh, to actually feed her. So this clothing of the earth with life is actually terribly important. So you'll notice that everything reflects God himself. God is light, God is life, and God is love. So he's actually putting a little bit of heaven on the earth. And this is why we call it paradise. But there are other reasons why we call it paradise as well. But then we're told that in spite of all the billions of galaxies and everything else, he actually gives us two great lights. One is the sun, that is providing the energy for the earth and the light and the warmth and all the rest of it. And the other is the moon to give us a little night light so that we're not in complete darkness. So in heavenly terms, these are called our nearest neighbors. And we weren't told anything about the galaxies out there, but we were told something about the sun and the moon, that they were to help us to determine time, to determine the seasons. Okay, in other words, 
Now, we're told that the heavens uh, carry a book for us and that we should look up to the heavens for our book. And we know from um, ancient history that the ancient peoples in the world did look to the heavens enormously for everything. Uh, and the signs in the heavens, what we call the, the zodiac or the constellations, uh, were prophetic and seasonal and all the rest of it, but they were not occultic. That is a, a later degeneration. So let me just perhaps uh, finish with this uh, and you will read the books of the heavens in Psalm 19 verses 1 to 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. That is the book of the heavens. Thank you for listening. Slána Gaspanach Daily. Goodbye. I want to give you a little message from me, and that is that the Word of God is the second great food that God has given to us. The first one is the Eucharist. The second one, the manna from heaven, is the Word of God. And the third one is prayer. But in order to give people the Word of God, a lot of people have to do an enormous amount of work. They have to go into a great deal of research and do a lot of homework. You mightn't realize it. Jesus told his apostles that the laborer was worthy of his hire. And in other words, that they were to feed the people spiritually, but that the people should enable the apostles to be able to do the work. So I want to make a little uh, plea for you on behalf of Shalom World TV to ask you that if the Word of God is really feeding you, it's, if it's giving you life, if it really is what God wanted it to be, and we're trying very hard to do that, that you would respond by enabling them to be able to continue giving you this. Your donation would actually give life to others and enable them to work. And the Lord would reward you and we would be very grateful. Thank you. For fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World.